Hello, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about our work on finding bugs in the AART64 backend using automated translation validation. LLVM supports a variety of different backends. Looking at the repo at the moment, we see 24 backends just in the upstream branch. At a high level, a backend takes the input LLVM IR and outputs target-specific machine code. Under the hood, a lot of things are done so that a backend can generate correct and performant code. The input IR goes through different stages and different intermediate representations until code is emitted. For example, instruction selection converts the input LLVM IR into target-specific machine instruction. The figure here shows instruction selection via selection DAG. Another instruction selector is global iCell. In selection DAG, before conversion to machine instructions, the LLVM IR is converted to a DAG, which goes through several stages, including optimizations, before being converted to a sequence of machine instructions. Later stages perform more optimizations until machine code is emitted. I barely scratched the surface, but I think we can all agree that the steps involved in backend code generation is complicated. And this complexity may result in bugs. To test the backend, the LLVM test suite makes use of lit and file check. File check matches the test case output to a pattern specified by the developer. My talk is about using another approach to test the backend, which is to use automated translation validation to find bugs in the backend. More concretely, we have used this approach for the ART64 backend, which has led us to finding and reporting new bugs. Our tool is called ARM TV and is based on Alive 2. Now I'm briefly going to talk about Alive 2 and introduce some of the related concepts. In Alive 2, for a source IR function and its optimized version, unlike file check, which uses developer specified patterns as its test oracle, Alive 2 checks for refinement between the source and the target IRs. Now, what is refinement? For a pair of functions, the refinement relation is satisfied when for every possible input state, the target function displays a subset of the behaviors of the source function. Further, you may ask, why refinement and not equivalence? Well, in LLVM, the result of an instruction could be undefined behavior, which adds non-determinism to the IR function. The result of a compiler transformation is allowed to remove on non-determinism, but not add to it, which means that the output of a transformation may not be equivalent to its source making refinement checking a more suitable test oracle than checking for equivalence when working with LLVM transformation. Other sources of non-determinism are poison values and undef values, which sit between concrete value and immediate undefined behavior in how undefined they are. Our life too is fully automated. It uses an SMT solver to perform the refinement check. Further, it's designed to not report, uh, to not report any false alarms. For a given pair of LLVM IR functions, Alive2 checks for refinement between the source and the target of the transformation and produces three possible results. Correct, not correct with example, or timeout. Timeout is self-explanatory, but let's go over a simple example that shows the two other possibilities. Here we have an example of a correct transformation. Both functions perform an addition. However, the source function has the no unsigned wrap keyword on its add instruction. This keyword implies when the result of an addition is an unsigned integer overflow, the produced result is a poison value. For this pair of source and target functions, the refinement relation is satisfied if the result of the optimized IR is more defined than the source IR. In this and this is the case here since the target function produces the same output when there is no unsigned overflow and produces a defined value when there is an unsigned overflow instead of the poison value returned in the source function. So Alive uh, reports this as a correct transformation. However, the re this transformation is not correct in the other direction since the target function can produce a poison value on inputs when there's some overflow. Alive2 identifies this transformation as not correct. Further, it provides a counterexample where the target function produces a less defined value than the source function. Here we see the example input and the result of the two functions. With ARM TV, we wanted to enhance Alive2 to support refinement checking for the AART64 backend. 
Since the backend produces assembly, we cannot directly pass the resulting assembly to a live tool without making significant changes to it. Hence, the solution we came up with, ARM TV, is to build a lifter that lifts the assembly to the IR, to the source IR's representation. The lifted IR must faithfully emulate the behavior of the assembly produced by the backend. The output of the lifter alongside the source IR is, are then used to find refinement violation in the AR64 backend. The workflow is as follows. We start with the source IR function. We then use the code gen to emit its assembly. Our tool then uses the source IR and the emitted assembly pro to produce the lifted assembly IR, and then checks for the refinement between the source IR and the lifted IR that emulates the emitted assembly. So for this talk, uh, let's take a look at a small example instead. I'll walk through some of the steps that the tool goes through to lift the emitted uh, assembly. First, let's look at the source function in LLVM IR. The function f compares its input parameter to the value 777. If its unsigned interpretation is smaller than this number, it increments it by one and returns it. Otherwise, it returns the input parameter unchanged. The emitted assembly works similarly, except it uses a conditional increment instruction instead of branching into different basic blocks. Now let's look at the lifter's output. The assembly. Uh, uh, first, the lifter needs to uh, model the, the calling convention and the parameter passing rules from the AR64 ABI. For this simple example, we have a single parameter that, according to the ABI rules, is passed through the X0 register, which is a 64-bit register. And it's also the register used to return the function's 64-bit return value. Second, since the lifted IR is in SSA, SSA form, while the emitted assembly isn't, uh, the lifter converts the generated assembly into SSA form. We need to do this for writes to the same re hardware registers and maintain the processor state using virtual registers in SSA form. So the concept of poison and undef don't exist at the assembly level. The lifter models this by freezing the input parameter uh, to remove potential poison and undef values on the input parameters. The lifter needs to also keep track of the processor state. For example, the compare instruction updates the processor P state flags based on the comparison result. The flags are then used in the conditional in increment instruction that follows. The lifter keeps track of the relevant P state, in this case, in the virtual register PS0. Later, it uses this value in the condition for the select instruction to choose the correct output. Now that we've seen a simple example, I want to talk about modeling the sine x and 0x attribute in more detail. Looking at this snippet that is taken from the Langref, we see that the 0x attribute can be added to the input parameters uh, or the return value of a function. When added to a parameter, the code gen is instructed that the caller 0 extends to the extent required by the target's ABI. When added to the function's return value, the called function, also known as the callee, should extend its return value, zero extend its return value. The sine x attribute works similarly, except its sine extends instead of zero extending. What's interesting about these attributes is that they don't impact the semantics at the LLVM IR level, but instruct the code gen. Hence, when doing backend verification work, we need to correctly model them. Let's look at a concrete example. Here we have two different variations of a simple function. The function XORs its I8 input parameter with the value 255, effectively performing a bitwise NOT operation. In the second function, there is a sine X attribute on the function's return value. The sine X attribute on the return value obligates the emitted function to sine extend its result, in this case to 32 bits. Now let's look at the emitted code for these functions. Both functions use the move not instruction to perform a bitwise not, matching the semantics of the source IR. However, for the second function with the sine x attribute on its return value, the generated code has an additional SXTB instruction, which stands for the sine extend extract byte instruction. This, instru this instruction extracts the negated byte from the previous instruction and sine extends it to 32 bits before returning it in the register W0. This sign extension is required by the attribute 
because without it, the top 24 bits uh, of the 32-bit W register can have any arbitrary value. Now, the sine x attribute uh, on the return value puts an obligation on the code gen. This obligation results in a difference in the emitted code. However, our tool checks for refinement between the source IR and the lifted assembly. If the code gen doesn't properly emit code that fulfills this obligation, performing a refinement check from the source LLVM function will not catch this since the obligation is not explicitly expressed in the source IR function. To correctly check for refinement in the presence of, let's say, the sine x attribute on the return value of a function, we need to rewrite the source function to express the Kali's sine extension obligation. We see this chain highlighted, uh, this changes highlighted in the, on the box on the rewritten source IR. Now, note that in this case, the backend emits the correct code here by generating an SXTB instruction that is later expressed in the lifted IR. Now, with ARM TV, we have access to a test oracle that checks for refinement between the source IR and the emitted backend code. However, to find bugs, we need, a uh, we need a suite of test cases to complete the fuzzing loop. During early development, we used OpFuzz, a simple LLVM generator, and the LLVM unit test suite. These were not very effective in finding LLVM bugs, perhaps because the generated output was too simple in the former, and in the latter, regressions are minimal for such a widely used backend in the test suite. Hence, we paired our tool ARM TV with a live mutate a mutation engine that my colleague Yu Yu Fan has developed and already presented in the dev meeting. You can check out uh, the talk description at this link. So now, let's talk about results. Using ARM TV, we found and reported uh, 19 bugs so far, Mo most of which have been fixed in the repo. Uh, some are listed here, and the full list can be accessed at the link below. Most of the bugs here were found by test cases generated by a live mutate. All of them are miscompilation bugs. Most of the bugs were in the instruction selection stage, which uh, with about half of them being in selection DAG and about half in global ICEL. Four of the bugs were in other stages or in the backend, and three of them were in parts of the backend that is target independent. So they were also reproduced when using targets other than the AR64 backend. So here, I'm going to quickly go over two of them. The first one starts with this uh, function generated using a live mutate. This function uses non-canonical IR with several constant parameters. If we simplify this code by hand or run up, we see that the function should return, uh, should return one. However, the generated code returned zero at the time when we reported this part. Uh, this bug is uh, now fixed in the latest version of LLVM. The next bug involves the sine x attribute that I introduced earlier in this talk. Uh, the langref states that the sine x attribute, depending on whether it's on the input parameter or the return value, obligates the code gen to sine extend the affected parameter or the return value. However, langref leaves some of the details to the target ABI. We know that backend code generation can be impacted by the bit width of the source LLVM IR. Initially, when we ran our tool, we saw that it was finding refinement violations when dealing with functions that were using sine x on Boolean types, but not on any wider int types. We reported this uh, refinement violations. After the bug uh, discussion, we were referred to this table from the procedure call standard in the AR64 architecture. From this table, it can be somewhat implied that the AR64 backend can treat functions uh, with a sine x attribute on a Boolean parameter differently compared to wider types. This exception can be stated as follows. When having a sine x attribute on an i1 parameter, the caller implicitly zero extends it to an i8 first, and then sine extends it to 32 bits. Well, effectively zero extending the i1 parameter to 32 bits. So we updated our tool to treat sine x on i1 types uh, differently, as stated in that rule. However, later we found this test case uh, that leads to a refinement violation under the modified rule. 
This is the counter example reported by our tool. At the LLVM IR level, we have the I1 value one as the first function parameter. On line two, the function zero extends this value and subtracts it from the function's second parameter, uh, the value zero, producing the result minus one. At the assembly level, we see that the emitted code is performing an addition between its two parameters. However, since the first function parameter has a sine x attribute, the backend assumes that the value one is zero extended to an i32 under the, stated, the, the rule stated above, causing the function to return one, resulting in a value mismatch between the two functions. So then we reported this value mismatch, and after some discussion, it was agreed that the backend should prioritize the sign extension over the implicit zero extension to an IA. The new rule is summarized in the gray box. Now let's check the output of the emitted code under the adjusted rule. Under this rule, it is assumed that the caller sign extends the I1 value to an I32, resulting in minus one instead. This time, the output of the assembly matches the output of the LLVM IR. So this bug was produced because of the subtle interactions between Langref, the backend code gen, and the target ABI. An interesting question that arises is where should such rules be stated in the documentation? Uh, I'll start wrapping up by saying that ARM TV is still a very much work in progress, but it has shown some promising results even in its current state. We're looking at improving its support for memory operations. Currently, the tool has rudimentary support for passing function parameters via the stack. We're also working on adding support for pointer types and performing function calls. The tool has some rudimentary support for vector instructions. To speed up development, we're looking into deriving the lifting code using formal semantics rather than handcrafted code based on reading the documentation. Lastly, we're looking into supporting other backends. The first one we're considering is the RISC-V backend. This seems like the most natural backend to target next since formal semantics for it exists in a format similar to the ARH64 ar architecture, which we are already looking into for lifting its vector instructions. So uh, let me conclude. Uh, in this talk, we showed that automated translation validation can be help uh, find bugs in the LLVM backend. Uh, you can check out both ARM TV and Alive in the links and the QR code shown here. Since ARM TV is uh, still a work in progress, it hasn't been added to the Alive 2 upstream branch just yet. Uh, and further, it's not still accessible via Alive 2's compiler explorer instance. Hopefully, once the tool um, is more mature, we will make it available as a compiler explorer instance. Uh, and lastly, thank you to the, uh, to the LLVM developers who fixed the bugs that we reported, and thank you for listening to this last talk of the day. Okay, so now we have some minutes for questions. Okay. I have at least two questions. Uh, what point are you listing from? So we take the... Uh, assembly that is uh, emitted. So, uh, so like the actual, like you went through the full assembly, are you still seeing your like? Yeah, so we just go over a sequence of MC ints and then like lift it to uh, a live IR, which is like homomorphic with uh, LLVM IR. Okay, so you have code that's basically doing inverse legalization up to the IR. Yeah. And how do you do that exactly? So uh, I guess the most, um, I guess you kind of have to reverse all of the steps that the code gen has to do. So one of the things that I mentioned was like, the yeah, assembly is not in SSA, so you have to kind of generate SSA again. And then uh, I guess a lot of logic has to also go into like yeah, capturing the exact uh, behavior of the underlying like machine, the P state. So we also encode those when we're lifting the code. Uh, right now, the process was uh, basically uh, based on like handcrafted code that we were generating for each instruction. So that's why I mentioned that we're looking into automating this part by looking at the formal semantics when moving into supporting the vector instruction. That, that's the part that's hard. So I'm working on that. Uh, for me, I think this would be useful if we could lift from Gmir, because like we're repeating a lot of the same transformations that we want to do like in this combined, except with a slightly richer set of network operations to where we're doing a lot of the same thing. So Mm -hmm. I guess that 
My question is a continuation of the previous one. So I guess the type information, everything is lost when you go to assembly because that is also included back in the new year after the test. So right now we uh, support like uh, integer types. Uh, so based on that, uh, we basically emulate the underlying machine and then the machine has like 64-bit register. So we work with 64-bit register values when we're lifting it and then do a lot of like truncations and sign extensions to make it so that the types match with the source IR. Okay. Uh, and I guess for the vectors, we also assume that we're using 128-bit vector register and then uh, up is do the operation on that. Okay. But we support the smaller types uh, by, again, doing zero extensions and converting the uh, type to widen or narrow it. Also, you mentioned you're using LLVM test suite as the starting point for all of these mm -hmm. tests. Does it include all the backend tests as well? I think so. It was like around the, the starting state for the mutator was around 270,000 functions. So I think, yeah, it did include those. Thanks for your talk, and sorry, I also have a question on lifting. Uh, one of the most difficult problems regarding lifting in general is recovering stack. How, how do you recover stack? So uh, again, right now the support for like stack is relatively rudimentary, uh, and the type of functions that we tested are relatively like small functions. So we're not working with like anything like super big, I guess, assembly. So we haven't encountered it yet. As we move forward, I guess you we use have to. LVN test suite, right? Those are real world programs. Yeah, but uh, I think like the tool starts with those, but it doesn't necessarily support all of them when it's once working. We just like use that as a starting point, as a seed for the mutator. Uh, the cool thing is that uh, if you fail, it doesn't indicate anything. But if you can actually lift something and then find a value mismatch, then you're guaranteed that you find a bug. So that's why as a tool, it's like expanded. You can start finding like more bugs. But, yeah. yeah, because we have a lot of painful stories on how you lift in like binaries, and a lot of time we can only like lift it into we call it emulated stack, like um, like it's like embedding an emulator into your lifted IR, and it's not fun when you want to do like any meaningful memory analysis. So uh, I was really curious about the stack lifting parts. I see. Yeah, I mean, for the rudimentary parts, like uh, because Alive already supports like uh, LLVM memory instructions, we just use that to do the encoding, and it seems to work. But again, we didn't try it with anything more complicated. I'm assuming that it might just like time out or something if it becomes too complicated. Thank you. No. Okay. Any any more questions? No. Okay. Then let's thank Nader once again.